or so we hope will be the case. Uh, we are um, going to be looking at uh, a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 5, and Lord willing, He'll give me the strength to be able to um, say what needs to be said without breaking down and coughing. Um, that's always the danger when you have uh, any type of cold or laryngitis. I do want to thank Greg for being willing to lead worship and uh, take the, uh, uh, the burden of the first part of the, of the uh, service to uh, give a little additional uh, rest and strength. But let's, uh, let's begin by reading in uh, Matthew chapter 5 again. This time we're going to read the first 20 verses of, uh, of that chapter, Matthew chapter 5. And this is perhaps the most familiar part of the Sermon on the Mount, I think, to, uh, to all of us. But we're going to be uh, particularly looking at verses 17 through 20 for another one of those things the Lord tells us <clears throat> that He's looking for in us as He looks throughout the earth, what it is that uh, causes that light, as it were, that catches His attention. So Matthew 5, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, may the Lord bless <clears throat> his word to our hearing this morning. Well, I think, um, <clears throat> I think it goes without saying that as we read the Bible and come across such statements like this one that tell us that doing this or that will make us great or greater or even greatest in the kingdom of God, that we should pay attention to it because the Lord is telling us that He places a particular premium on that characteristic and He's telling us that we should do the same thing. Now, we find one of these in our text this morning. As you know, this, uh, this passage uh, falls in one of the most famous sermons, one of the most well-known sermons in Scripture, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, so-called because Jesus preached it, as we know, from uh, the, the top of a mountain. He went up on the mountain and sat down and began to 
preach to his disciples. Now, some actually see this, and, and perhaps this is actually what's going on, as a second Sinai, a second giving of the law. Actually, you might call it a third giving because in Deuteronomy we have the second giving. But Moses, as you know, went up on Mount Sinai to receive God's law for his people and to declare it to them. Here we see God taking our nature to himself, climbing up to the top of a mountain to again deliver his law because the teachers of the law had failed to deliver it uh, to Israel. And Israel, for the most part, hadn't listened to it. As a matter of fact, you know, there's various interpretations on that passage that uh, Greg read a little bit earlier, the, the second part of Matthew 5, what Jesus is actually doing. Some believe that Jesus is quoting the Old Testament law and he's changing it. Uh, he's telling us that's what you've heard, but this is what I say to you. He's going against his father. He's telling us now what things are going to be like in the new covenant. But actually what Jesus is telling us is that things haven't really changed at all. Uh, he's trying to, to make that point is over against the teachers of Israel who were teaching the people that things were different than they were. Uh, the teachers had twisted the law to their own ends so that they could do it, what it was they really wanted to do. But Jesus is lifting the law back up to where God originally intended it to be. As a matter of fact, this one who is delivering the law is not a different person than the one who gave it in the first place, who actually wrote it on the tablets of stone with his own finger. It's the same person who did it. Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Word of God in human flesh, but He wants us to know what God desires of us. Well, as we've read through this uh, earlier part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, first of all, reminds us that there are certain characteristics that will be true of everyone who believes in Him. This is not a series of blessings upon people who sort of give um, uh, random, uh, sort of have random characteristics. This is actually an entire package that each of us will have if we're trusting in the Lord and things we should be cultivating. We call these the Beatitudes and perhaps we'll look at some of those in, in the near future. A second, having these characteristics, Jesus tells us the kind of effect that we ought to have in this world, what our presence here should be producing. We should be like salt in this world, preserving as it were, the world from further progress in sin or perhaps even stopping it. That's what the, uh, the, the declaration of God's Word can do, it can turn people from their sins, it can stop sin. Uh, we are those who are to be the, the light of the world or the light in this dark world. In other words, we should be witnesses also of the Lord through our words and through our actions. And by the way, this certainly means declaring the gospel but it also means living the gospel. It's not going to do much good if we say things but then don't do them. Uh, Jesus says that we should do our good works in such a way that men may see them and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Now, thirdly, I think he goes on to spell out um, uh, or to tell us what this witness should consist of a bit more clearly by reminding us of the principles that we are to live by that we might that we might be salt and that we might be light, that we might be like Him, that we might actually point the way to God. Jesus reminds us of the standard that God wants us to live by, the standard of His law. Now, sometimes we forget that Jesus didn't come into the world merely to save us, although He did come into the world to save us, and we should be very thankful that He did that. But He came into the world to transform us, to free us from our sins, to make us to be more like Him so that we can point uh, the way to Him, to, to others. Again, I believe that's what Jesus means when He says, let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, the more that we are able to do this, the more useful we are going to be to Him. Which is why he tells us this morning, the more you keep his commandments and teach others to do the same, the greater you will be in his kingdom. 
again, Christianity is represented, and I think you're probably getting, uh, probably getting to see this point. Christianity is often represented as the Lord just simply saves the people. Everybody's the same. Everybody does what they can. Everybody goes to heaven, at least those whom he saved. And it doesn't really matter what we do. But I think as we're looking at this, we're seeing that there are things that the Lord wants us to do, and the more we do those things, uh, the more, uh, well, the, the greater we're going to be in His kingdom, the more glory we're going to give to Him, and the more glory we are going to receive in heaven. It does make a difference how much we love Him and how much we serve Him, how much we seek to do what it is He actually made us to do. So this morning, I want us to look at uh, three things. First of all, that Jesus didn't come into the world to abolish the commandments or to make obedience obsolete. Rather, He made it, He came into the world to make it possible for us to keep the commandments. He came to transform us. Secondly, that the commandments that He wants us to keep are the moral commandments. You know, we are, there's always the question of which ones, you know, how does the Old Testament differ from the New what carries over? What are we supposed to be doing? Well, it boils down to the moral commandments. And then finally, the point that the more we keep these commandments and the more we encourage others to keep them as well, the greater we will be in the kingdom of heaven because the more useful we're going to be to Him, the more like Jesus we're going to be like so first of all, let's consider that Jesus didn't come into the world to abolish the commandments or to make obedience obsolete. Rather, He came into the world to make it possible for us to obey or to keep the commandments. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, again, I think you've already heard that some believe that Jesus means by this that since He fulfilled them, we don't have to keep them. Or the reason why He fulfilled them was so that we would not have to do it from this point forward. And perhaps you've heard some people say, oh, no, I, I don't worry about this commandment or that commandment, keeping that commandment, because I'm in Christ. I've trusted Him. And in Christ, I'm perfect. I fulfill the commandments in Christ. As a matter of fact, that's how the uh, Sabbath is often observed by people today. I observe it in Christ. He fulfilled it. I don't have to. Uh, thankfully, they don't apply that necessarily to all the commandments. They say it, but they don't do it because they know, well, Jesus didn't commit adultery, therefore I don't do it in Him, and I can do what I want to do. Well, that just, of course, is not true. Because Jesus didn't come into the world to leave us bound to that which He knew would destroy us, uh, to keep us prisoners of that which His Father actually hates, sin, but rather to free us from those sins, to break the power of sin so that we can do what's right, so that we can become more like Him. He actually came to give us the power to obey the commandments so that we could follow His example. And of course, He does that by His Holy Spirit. Now, that's what Paul means in Romans chapter 8, in verses 3 and 4, if you listen to this carefully. For what the law could not do, and what he means is while it was written on stone, you know, while it was outside of us, uh, just a standard that we had to obey, what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, that is, our inability to, to keep it, God did, sending His own Son in the, in, uh, in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now listen to this. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that it just simply works in us in principle so that, you know, at least on our record, as it were, in heaven, uh, we've got all perfect scores. But what he means is, by the law being fulfilled in us, that we actually begin to do what it is that the Lord calls us to do in the commandments. In other words, we begin to love as the Lord calls us to love. The author to the Hebrews actually tells us that this is one of the greatest blessings of the new covenant, 
that the law is, is no longer written just upon tablets of stone, but now it is written on our hearts. That God has given us the power to keep them. Again, this very familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 8, quoting from Jeremiah 31. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, the Lord didn't come to do away with the commandments. He came to take the commandments written on stone put them in our minds and write them on our hearts by His Holy Spirit. In other words, He came to give us the power to obey them by freeing us from our sins. I think the fact that He never intended to do away with the commandments helps us to understand why the Lord goes on to say in, in our text this morning that heaven and earth will pass away before the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law. That whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in his kingdom, you see. And also that your righteousness must be greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. If the Lord had left us bound in our sins, then we would be the same as the scribes and the Pharisees, and our righteousness would not be greater. There is a sense in which this refers, of course, to the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us, given to us by faith. But if you look at the, at the context of the entire book of, of, well, the entire Bible, but in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not saying, I'm going to you know, simply uh, give you a perfect righteousness that is, that is, you know, not necessarily, it's not yours, it's, it's, it's mine, it's going to get you into heaven and that's all. But rather, He's come to transform us and what He's saying is that that transformation must make you different than the scribes and Pharisees who had a legal obedience. They had that obedience that Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 8, the law written on stone and just flesh to try to keep it. In the new covenant, the Lord has written it on our hearts, and He has given us the power to do it by His Holy Spirit so that our lives will be transformed and our actual practical righteousness will be greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it so that He could give us His Holy Spirit so that that law might be fulfilled in us, in our lives, that we might be transformed. Now, the second point is, since He came that we might be transformed, that we might be uh, obedient, I think it's important for us to understand which of the commandments that Jesus is actually referring to here. What, what does He want us to obey? Is it everything in the law and in the prophets? Well, not necessarily, because in the law and the prophets, there are actually three different kinds of law. And you've read the Westminster Confession, which is the confession of this church, perhaps. You've run across these terms. The civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. Now, the civil laws are those laws which God gave to Israel to govern them as a nation. And we have to admit that most of those laws are mainly applications of the moral law. Don't steal, don't commit adultery, and so forth. And if you do, this is how you rectify it. This is how you show repentance. In other words, you have applications of the moral law, and then you have penalties for disobedience, how to administer justice. The ceremonial laws that God gave to His people were, were to govern their worship. Uh, this is how I want you to worship me. And as we know, m most of those laws, if not all of them, actually were pointing to Jesus Christ. They were just, as they, as they carried them out, were grand pictures of what Jesus would do when He came into the world. And then we have, of course, the moral law that God gave to govern His people's conduct that express God's unchanging standard uh, because, of course, His morality never changes. How we are to conduct ourselves toward Him, how we are to love Him, and how we are to love our neighbor. Now, we have, of course, the... the um, what has been a very difficult task 
of trying to sort out which of these commandments still are binding and which of them are not as we move from the old covenant into the new covenant. Well, we, we actually, through the years, have developed a way to understand the commandments that makes it easier for us to sort through them and to know which ones remain and which ones don't. Uh, all of these laws can be divided further into two categories. And again, I don't know exactly why the first category is called why, what it is, but I, it's obvious why the second is what it is. But those command, or the, the two categories are positive commandments and moral commandments. Positive commandments, I suppose, in the sense that God tells us this is what I want you to do. And of course, when God says this is what I want you to do, then that's what you need to do. It's what I need to do. But these positive laws are a little bit different than moral laws because these laws are not necessarily moral in and of themselves. They are things which God says to do, which may not necessarily talk about things that, that have to do with morals, if I can put it that way. For instance, the ceremonial law, all of them are actually laws that are not necessarily moral laws that the priest should do this to the sacrifice before he offers it, that he should cleanse himself in a certain way, that he should be from a certain family line. Those things are not moral. I hope you can see that. Now, if God commands them to do that, it becomes moral, a moral imperative that they actually obey it. That's true. But God can change that, and it doesn't change morality, you know, as far as whether there's going to be priests at all or whether there's going to be sacrifices at all. Well, that's what positive laws are. The separation laws are also positive laws where the Lord said, I don't want you to sow two kinds of seed in one field. I don't want you to make a garment with two different types of fabric. Uh, those things are not moral in and of themselves. Of course, God says don't do it, you don't do it, but he can change that, you see. Those are things he can change. So if God commands it, you're bound to keep it, but he can just as easily change any positive law because it's not necessarily a moral law. But the other types of laws are moral, and those are the things that can never change. When would it ever be right to worship and love another God than the true God? When would it be right to say you're going to do one thing and do something else? or to dishonor your father and your mother, or to murder somebody, or to commit adultery, those things are moral in nature, and they will always be wrong to do, or right to do, depending upon what it is that God's requiring. Now, we know that Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law, all of which were positive, and so they have been set aside. We don't have to keep the ceremonial law. Israel is no longer a nation and so no longer governed by these civil laws, except, of course, for the moral principles that are still in it. Those would continue because they're moral. But the moral law, as I've said before, the law that was written on the tablets of stone, some believe it written on the stone to show its permanence, the law that the Spirit of God has written in our hearts, the same law that Jesus expounds in Matthew chapter 5, as we saw in our scripture reading this morning when he talks about murder and adultery and vows and the laws of retaliation, the law of love, these are moral principles and these are the things that will never change. These are the laws that he is actually fulfilling in us by his Holy Spirit, why he came into the world that he might do the work that was necessary to give us His Spirit, that it may be written on our hearts, that He may give us a love for these things so that we would do them and that we would encourage others to do the same thing, that it might be fulfilled in them as well. Jesus didn't come into the world to destroy obedience or to tell you you didn't have to obey. Jesus came into the world so that you could obey, and what it is He wants you to obey is the moral law. As a matter of fact, if you have the Spirit of God in your heart, that's what you want to do. Now, finally, what difference does it make whether you keep that law or you don't keep it? Well, Jesus says the more we keep it and encourage others to keep it, the greater we will be in His kingdom. Now, He also adds a warning in here that we need to take into account. 
He warns us, first of all, not to set aside, because of, of the continuance of, of the moral law, not to set aside even the least of these commandments. And again, remember that the moral law is not just the Ten Commandments. I mean, it is. That's the summary of it. But, you know, because you, you ask yourself this question, well, which, what does he mean, the least of the Ten Commandments? Which would be the least of those? Those are all important commandments. Well, I think what he's referring to here is not necessarily one of the ten, but I think he's referring to one of the very uh, least of those laws that was based upon those commandments in the Old Testament that are moral in nature, that we still need to keep. You can't set aside even the least of these, he says, or teach others to do the same, which is what the Pharisees had been doing. He says, if you do, you will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does that say about the idea that we don't have to keep the commandments? Of course, we have to keep them. We can't set aside even the least of them and encourage others to do the same thing. Now, what does that Jesus mean by this? You know, it's not entirely clear. Some commentators see this as a very strong affirmation. Jesus is saying that if you set aside any of his commandments, that you are actually going to exclude yourself from the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and in a certain sense, that is possible because G, uh, John tells us in 1 John 3, 9 that if we practice sin, that we do not know him, which means if we practice sin, we are not in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we're not just least in the kingdom, we're actually outside the kingdom of heaven. So how can we set aside any commandment that God requires of us and teach others to do that without practicing sin? So I think that's their reasoning behind this. If you're going to be of the sort that's just going to set aside the law of God, then you're setting yourself out of the kingdom. But it can also mean this, to the degree that we depreciate God's law or set any portion of it aside, and I think we'd have to say this by doing it ignorantly perhaps, I don't see how we could do it maliciously and still be in the kingdom of heaven. But to the degree that we do this, to that degree we will be depreciated in His kingdom. And that also seems to be implied by the reverse. Whoever keeps and teaches them will be great. Whoever sets aside the least and teaches others shall be least. But whoever keeps and teaches them all will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So on the one hand, we do need to guard ourselves against believing or doing anything that would weaken our own conviction regarding God's commandments or the conviction of others to keep His commandments. And of course, what we would do as far as encouraging them, we need to make sure that we embrace them. We need to make sure that we encourage others to do the same thing. Now, on the other hand, to the degree that we do keep them and encourage others to keep them, he says, to that degree, we will be called great in His kingdom. And we might ask the question, why? Why does that make us great in the kingdom of heaven? I suppose one answer might be because we're obedient. You know, it's, it's good to be obedient. Uh, it makes a difference in God's eyes. But it makes a difference not only for you personally, it makes a difference for others as well. It means that you will be more useful to the Lord because you will be more like the Lord and you will be doing exactly what Jesus did. Did Jesus keep the commandments? Did Jesus encourage others to keep the commandments? Everything he did was with that goal in mind. As a matter of fact, we're going to see more about that this evening. The kind of life that Jesus lived was one of just pure love to the Father, pure obedience to the Father in not only making his life a sacrifice, as it were, of obedience and honor to him, but trying to get as many people as he could to do exactly the same thing. And that's why, as we've already seen, Jesus came into the world. Now, let me just encourage you in closing not to believe everything that you hear, even if it comes from a well-meaning believer, somebody who professes faith in Christ. I mean, there are whole churches that believe that you don't have to obey God's commandments at all and to say that you have to obey them is to destroy the gospel. And again, you've heard me say that many times. They do exist. They're out there. And as a matter of fact, the majority of evangelical churches actually fall in that category. You don't need to obey them because Jesus obeyed them. If you say you have to obey them, then you are legalists. 
You have added works to salvation. But that isn't true. It is true that your obedience isn't going to get you into heaven. You're only going to get into heaven because of what Jesus did. But it's also true that if you are on your way to heaven, you will obey the Lord. Faith without works is dead faith which cannot save you. Jesus obeyed so that you would be able to obey, so that your life would be transformed, so that your righteousness would exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees so that you would enter into the kingdom of heaven. It is the evidence, not the grounds upon which you are saved, but it is the evidence that you are His. As a matter of fact, we're going to see this even more this evening. It is one of the main ways that you can know that you are His when you see Christ being formed in you, His character being, as it were, a part of your character. Now, it is true that we're far from perfect, and that's the way it's going to be while we're in this life, but it's also true that the more you progress toward heaven, the more you should see of Him in your life, the more you should be able to see His character being formed in you. And if you don't see that character being formed in you, it's because you really do not know the Savior, because every child that our Lord receives becomes like Him, a child of God, no longer a child of wrath, but now one who has His Spirit within, the inside is cleaned out, the outside is in the process of being cleaned out as well. If you don't see Christ being formed in you, then you do not have His Spirit, which means you, you are not saved. And if that is the case, you need to come to the Savior because He alone has the power to change you from the inside out. He alone can adorn your life with that power of His love to transform you into Him, into His image, that is. So if you do not see His image being formed in you, believe on Him and be changed. But if you do see that going on, remember this, that all of us have that to varying degrees. And the thing that the Lord holds out to us in that text, or in this text, to encourage us to press on more towards His character and likeness, towards obedience to Him, uh, and encouraging others to obey Him as well, is the prospect that to the degree that we do this, to that degree we will be great in His kingdom because we will be usable by Him to do His will. So let's strive to become more like our Savior. If you love Jesus, you must love something about Him, right? Not just that He saved you, but something about His character. Well, this is that part of His character, that His love for His Father, that He wants you to grow in and emulate so that you may be more useful to Him and honoring to Him and to His Father. Well, may the Lord give us uh, all grace to pursue that. Uh, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer.